Very good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Gabrielle. Thank you for prayer, Massimo, and uh, for everyone taking the, the time on this, uh, this Saturday morning. And uh, I'm certainly very happy to be with you. Uh, um, now, I think parents are the single most important influence on their children. And uh, as parents, we want to bring up our children to know and love Christ, uh, but often we don't know where to begin. Now, of course, uh, parenting is not the only part of uh, family ministry. Uh, some of us here today will be uh, grandparents, um, or we might be thinking about how to reach out to uh, other members uh, in our family. Uh, but in this session, what we're specifically going to be doing is thinking about how to practically engage in ministry at home, especially the home in which we are, uh, we are living most of the time, the people around us. And, uh, and why it matters that, uh, that we do. Now, I've got a few goals this morning, uh, but I'm happy for this session to go wherever it goes as you ask your, your questions. So uh, please do use the chat to be asking your questions. But this is what I've, uh, this is what I've prepared. Uh, I'm hoping to convince us that the primary goal of parenting is to bring up children to know and love Christ. I'm hoping to uh, equip us to practically know how to go about uh, intentionally discipling our children. Uh, think a bit about how to do the family devotion time as well. I want us to think about what it looks like to disciple uh, children in all of life and, uh, and to think about how to be a godly um, model as we love our spouse and involve our children in the life of the church. So uh, that's, that, that's specifically what I'm looking at, but I know that uh, when we say family discipleship, it's such a broad topic. You may have all kinds of things in, in mind, so do ask questions as you, as you feel uh, will be best. Now, even as I share those goals uh, with you, I know from my own personal experience uh, that, uh, that parents um, and especially mothers uh, feel a lot of guilt when it comes to thinking about ministry um, in the family. And of course, part of that guilt comes from we, we compare ourselves and our family to other families. Um, we realize that we, we don't always uh, live up to the standards uh, that we've set for ourselves that we that we hope um that we we love our spouse we love our kids we love our family and uh, and that just makes us uh, feel our failures and in our and in our inadequacy um all the more so uh, i want you to know just from the outset in this session that my my aim is not to you know make you feel more guilty um i want you to know that i speak as one imperfect spouse perfect um parent uh, to others and uh, like, uh, like you, my wife and I, we feel inadequate most of the time. Uh, we fail a lot. Um, and uh, this session is intended as an encouragement um, for us all to just strive again um, uh, to, to press on in this area. And remember that as we do, um, that our gracious God uh, gives us the grace to do it. Right? Because uh, in the end, we do trust in the sovereignty of God, don't we? Uh, we believe in the grace of God. And uh, we know that we have the word of God to guide us. And so despite our failures, uh, we're not without hope. And uh, we can enter this session, I think, with joy, excitement, and uh, not just uh, guilt and fear of thinking all the ways that we, we need to do better. Yeah. So uh, I look forward to learning from each other uh, and not just learning from me. Uh, so I want to begin that way. And uh, we will. I just want us to split into groups for a short time to think about uh, this uh, this uh, question on the screen, uh, what questions or struggles do you have about discipling your own family? What questions or struggles do you have uh, about discipling your own family? So, okay, I think we're all back. And uh, let me encourage you to uh, jot down some of those thoughts that you were just discussing, put it in the chat. What were the questions? What were the struggles that you have? Uh, it'd be really, uh, that'd be really helpful uh, that we can shape the session as we move on. Now, I, I want this session to be reasonably practical, but I do think it is important that we set the right foundation with the gospel from the word of God. So I'll move through this really relatively quickly, but uh, this is the foundation, of course, it's very important. Um, so let's, uh, let's think uh, about the why, and then we'll get to, uh, to the how. So the gospel and the family, and uh, the gospel foundation, a good place to look 
at this is Ephesians 2. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk into walk in them that's a, such an important verse uh, for us as we think about family ministry because as i said we feel so guilty and um we think uh you know if our if our children are not going well with the lord or we feel like we're not um, being good examples or we can just feel we, we can feel so guilty about it we can really feel like failures and it's so important for us to remember that we're saved by grace not by works um God loves us not because we're good parents or good grandparents or good spouse, but because Jesus died for us. And um, it's really important that we approach this topic with grace, that we, we receive the grace of God ourselves. And the more that we're able to receive the grace of God for ourselves and embrace it, of course, um, we will be able to show grace um, in our, our family ministry as well. This great book that I, I read some years back, uh, it's called Grace-Based Parenting, explores these kind of issues that at length, um, I certainly would commend that um, that book to you. There's so many good parenting books out there, but I guess this is a great one that's thinking about how does the gospel of grace affect how we do uh, parenting. Uh, the other thing we see in this verse, though, is we're not just saved by grace, but we're saved for good works, aren't we? That uh, uh, we're creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. And, uh, and, and part of those good works that God's prepared is, is going to be our family ministry. So one of the ways that we can be thankful to God, show our thanks to God for the salvation that we've received is, is how, we, um, how, how we love our family. Right? Um, so the, the next uh, thing is that we think about is uh, as, we, as we do, um, as we receive the gospel of grace and we respond with these transformed lives full of good works, um, we're not just uh, showing the gospel in our family, but we're actually making the gospel known in the heavenly realms. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, you can see there in verse 10, he says that, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly uh, places. So, you know, as, as the gospel is preached, as people receive it and as they live it out, um, it's actually proclaiming the victory of Christ um, to to the in, in the heavenly places um to even to all these uh evil evil uh, spiritual beings that we would read of in Ephesians 6 um so it's a it's a grand calling family ministry i think it's so common for you know my mother will say oh i'm i i'm just looking after children i'm just changing diapers i'm just taking the kids to school no it's not just <laughs> um i i would put to you that this is your first first ministry and as you as you respond to the grace of god by loving your family you are making you're, you're bringing glory to god in the heavenly places you're making god's victory known this is not a small thing never just put your down, yourself down and say just yeah um, so this grace transforms us and uh, we see as we come to ephesians Chapter four, chapters one to three, all about what God has done. And now chapters four to six, how we respond. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Or again, verse 17, this I say and testify in the Lord, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. So as we receive the gospel of grace, we are transformed by it. We are to live lives that are different, that are worthy of the grace that we have received. And uh, two of the contexts that Paul picks up as he goes on in this letter is, is in marriage and in the family, right? So we'll be familiar with Ephesians 5, I'm sure, where it says, uh, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And we notice that language there of um, that the real marriage is actually the real, the ultimate marriage, if you like, is the marriage between Christ and the church. And so our human marriages, as the way we relate to each other as husband and wife, as we, um, yeah, as we uh, express gentle submission and sacrificial um, service, as we do that as wives and husbands, um, again, we're actually um, making, uh, making the gospel known, making Christ known um, as we live out, live out and, um, and shine forth the gospel in our marriages. And so in that, that verse 32, he says, uh, this mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And it's just quoted from Genesis 2, God's design for marriage. And he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church, the ultimate marriage. 
So it's not just in our marriages though, uh, but also in our families and uh, uh, children are addressed notice uh, um, within the church. Um, I think God considers children to be members of the church. Uh, that's maybe a topic for another time. Uh, but children, um, how they treat their parents, um, obey your parents in the Lord. So as ch children obey their parents as a way of pleasing God. I'm teaching a children's workshop this afternoon for young ch children, five to 12. And uh, that's my main point. Obey your parents because you love Jesus. Um, God has given you the gift of salvation. So you respond, show your thanks by one of the ways is by obeying your parents. Um, and same with the parents with their children um, as, uh, as, as fathers and of course mothers as well. Um, bring their children up to know and love Jesus. That, that, that's a really important way that we, um, that, that we live out the gospel. And, and in this, uh, again, we're, we're trying to model like our, uh, like our heavenly father. Uh, back in chapter three, uh, we read, for this reason I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven on earth is, is named. God is the father of the great family. And uh, even in our fatherhood, our parenting, we, we model him and therefore we make him known as we do so. Uh, so what I'm saying then is how we, how we live in our families is a crucial area in which we respond to the gospel and in which we showcase the gospel to the world. It's a high calling. It's an important area of Christian life. I just want to double click those uh, two areas uh, a little bit more and, uh, and, and, and draw out uh, practically, but feel free to ask questions as we go. All right, so let's think firstly about uh, serving our spouse. And our first ministry is always to our spouse. Uh, we're married, we've made a, a covenant commitment to them, right, which we probably haven't made to, to our church unless we're in Massimo's church, right? Um, that is, uh, we promise our spouse to love them for rich, for poor, uh, for better, for worse, uh, and, uh, until death do us part, right? We, we, we make this, uh, this, these promises to them. Um, and so uh, apart from the gospel, it's giving the gospel as itself to, to our children. Um, the best gift that we can really give them is a godly marriage. Right? Um, so what does this look like? Um, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Um, husbands are to sacrificially uh, love their wives, lay down their life for their wives. That's what Christ did. He, he, he sacrificed himself on the cross so that we could be saved. Uh, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves him himself. So this is, if you're a, if you're a, a husband, um, if you think about family ministry, this is, your, this is your first ministry. Love your wife. Sacrifice everything um, to love them. That's the first lesson in parent. Love your spouse. I mean, I think one thing that there's a big change that happens when the first child turns up on the scene, isn't it? And suddenly the, 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 the attention moves from, uh, the, from loving each other to, to think everything revolves around the children, isn't it? The whole routine changes. And sometimes you even start calling each other, um, you know, mummy and daddy instead of, you know, whatever affectionate names that we, um, that we used to. And, uh, and sadly, in some couples, it would, they even forget how to talk to one another. Um, spend all the time talking to the kids and eventually when the kids grow up and, and move out, which they hopefully will eventually, um, you, 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 they don't know how to interact with each, each other anymore and so they just watch a lot of television um, to fill the space. But no, we, we, we always need to invest in our marriage first and um, of course that's going to be hard um, when um, we have children, especially in the early stages, but um, that's, that's really important. Um, so husbands, sacrificial love, and of course, the wives, the gentle submission, that is a, a way that we can um, express our love for Jesus. And uh, you probably read that, heard of, at least heard of that book in the five love languages, and uh, reminds that there's different ways to show our affection to our spouse, um, you know, spending time together, um, giving them gifts, words of affirmation, acts of service, you know, like throwing the rubbish or 
whatever my wife always says she feels love when I throw out the rubbish yeah <laughs> um, physical intimacy as well and of course some people feel more love with one of those than the other but um, uh, it's not saying oh, just because your wife only mainly feels love with words of affirmation that you never throw out the rubbish and you never give them any gifts for their birthday and you're, you're love with all of these ones but uh, you're aware of how especially you can love your your own spouse um, so it's it's really important that we we keep moving towards um, our spouse. Uh, you probably heard that, you know, that famous uh, little catchphrase that's thrown around, thrown around from time to time, like about dating your dating your wife, dating your husband. Um, the, in other words, the pursuit is not meant to end on the wedding day. That's meant to just be the, the beginning of pursuit. And either you can choose to continue to pursue your spouse or you can stop, in which case you will you'll gradually grow apart from them. Um, we need to intentionally invest in, uh, in our marriage, yeah? And there are various ways that we can be encouraging our spouse in Christ. Um, of course, uh, it's important that we're reading the Bible and praying together. That can be really hard, isn't it? When, uh, when you've got young kids running around, um, it's looked at various, it's changed over the years as we've done it. Uh, feel free to ask about that. Um, encouraging our spouse in Christian fellowship. Um, again, it's especially important, I guess, for, for mothers, isn't it? Because um, sometimes you're at home all the time. It's not so easy to get to church. You don't, it's not easy to get the Bible studies. Um, you know, validating the ministry in the home. Um, I think in general, we live in a, in a culture um, where uh, I guess women are encouraged to work most of the time. I mean, before I came to Penang, I was in St. Mary's Cathedral, a big church, it's probably 1,500 people in it um, on a, for a regular weekly attendance. But there, there was a Bible study for, you know, for, for women um, on, uh, on Thursday mornings, and it was attended by either the retired or by stay-at-home mums. And there was probably only 10 to 15 Stay home mums in the whole church out of out of you know thousand five hundred, um, because the culture that we live in is one of you know, that you have the baby and then you go back to uh, go back to work and and that can uh, so if you're you are the one who's you're staying home um, with the children, it's easier to to think that you know I'm just a, I'm just a mother and this is not significant I need to get back to work and so it's really important. Um, that we surround ourselves with people who remind us that family ministry is important. Um, and being a stay-at-home mum is, is a great ministry to, uh, to invest in, right? So valid, validating and encouraging um, uh, one another in, uh, in, in, in the ministry. Uh, so I guess uh, that there's a few things there. And, I, and I'd say that uh, intentionality is, um, uh, is important in these things. Um, uh, to, to, to be trying to have those conversations with our spouse about how they're going in their relationship with Jesus. Um, again, it can be quite hard, isn't it? But even if it's just a, a question over the dinner after church, you know, how were you encouraged by the service today? Um, what have you been reading in God's word recently? How can I be praying for you? Um, so th those things can be good questions. And uh, you know, we can work out a routine. Maybe we try and read the Bible and pray over breakfast or after the kids sleep or whatever it is. Um, um, we can also do it sporadically as well. It doesn't really matter. It's the main thing is that we're, we're just trying hard to, to do that. And so let, let me just give a little encouragement then. If uh, it's been a little while since you've had regular Bible reading or prayer with your, with your spouse, you know, don't, don't feel so guilty about it. But now's now's maybe a good time to just try again why don't we why don't we make a time to to, to read and read the bible and pray and, and 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 just chat about how we can be following jesus together as a, as a family okay so serving our spouses a few thoughts there now let's go on to discipling children and uh of course the, the god-given role for parents is that they disciple children right um, I know you know this already, but it's really helpful to just be reminded, I guess. There are many, many verses. This is really the, probably the key point in parenting that you'll find in the Bible. Um, the Bible doesn't address parenting a lot directly, but the one point that it always makes is that 
um, parents to bring up their children to know Jesus, right? Um, Deuteronomy 4, um, they are to make known to your children, your children's children, what, you know, what God has done, uh, that they can teach their children as well. Deuteronomy 6, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Teach them diligently to your children and do it at, uh, in, in all of life. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes? Then you've got your answer ready. The expectation is that our children will ask us um, about our faith and why we're doing things and what does God's word mean and where to be ready to answer them. Yeah. Uh, Deuteronomy 11, uh, I, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you're walking in the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Again, note it's, it, it's all of life, right? It's not just family discipleship. It's not just like let's have a five-minute Bible time before the kids go to bed and, and, and that's it. I mean, that's a great thing to do, um, but uh, notice here it's, it, it's, all of, it's all of life as, you, as you're dropping them to school, as you're um, having, having lunch, as you're cleaning up the toys together, as you're putting the kids to bed, all of life, right? You are um, teaching them um, who God is and what it means to follow him. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, take these words to heart that you may command them to your children. Uh, again, I guess a reminder here that you can only give what you have, right? You must listen yourself first before you will be able to teach others. Uh, psalm 78, great, great psalm. Um, and be a great commitment to, I guess, echo these words for ourselves. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might, the wonders he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope uh, on, on God. Now, isn't it great? That resolve to make, um, make God known to the next generation, that they will hope in him. Uh, Proverbs 1.8, of course, the great wisdom book of the Old Testament, and it's set in the context of a, um, a father and mother giving wisdom to their, to their son, teaching, instructing. Uh, Proverbs 22.6, famous one, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, we have the example of, uh, of uh, Lois and Eunice, who um, had a big role to play in Timothy's life. And, uh, and, and then Paul comes back to this again, chapter three, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred um, writing. So uh, uh, it's very clear, I think, from all those verses, isn't it? Parents have a God-given responsibility to tell their children about, um, about Christ, right? to know him for themselves, to talk about him, to answer questions, um, and to do, this, um, to do this in all of life. Um, but I, I do have to repeat this, I guess, because uh, I know our natural ten tendency to want to outsource this to others. So you know, fathers will want to um, delegate the discipleship to the mother, and uh, perhaps the mothers are tempted to delegate the discipleship to maybe a maid, um, maybe to the Sunday school teachers. Uh, I've, I've always very much been resistant to having a maid in our own family because I wanted to make sure that we're discipling them ourselves. <laughs> um, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a maid, but it's good to think about how we can have our be the primary um, uh, disciples of our children. Now, uh, just as a bit of a brain break here, I, I asked my own children, you know, what do you think makes a good father? And uh, so, my four-year-old son, Christopher, this is what he said. Uh, he said, uh, a good father is someone who's helpful. Um, he has to, he can't shout at people. <laughs> uh, he has to write sermons, um, work. Uh, he has to kill bees and uh, shave. <laughs> Maybe that tells you a bit about what he observes me uh, doing <laughs> my daughter six-year-old carissa she said this uh good father will play piano 
uh, play badminton with her. Uh, we'll throw the rubbish. We'll uh, kill rats. There's a lot of pests in our place. <laughs> uh, write sermons and clean fans. <laughs> um, now, uh, this is, I guess it's, it's, it's always humorous to hear what, how our kids would describe us. Um, what, what, what about the Bible? What does the Bible say about these things? Um, see if I can share the slide back again. And as I said, the Bible doesn't say a lot directly about, about parenting. Um, but this is one key verse that we'll reflect on at a bit more length. Right? It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And notice who is doing it here. It says fathers, isn't it? Why fathers? So father is the head of the family, like we saw in Ephesians 5, marriage. Um, the husband is the head, the leader. The wife is the, the helper. Um, so as the head of the family, the father is to lead in the discipleship. The primary responsibility in bringing up children to know Jesus is the fathers. Now, it's not exclusively the fathers, of course, but it is um, uh, primarily, right? <laughs> we would say. Now, notice the manner. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline instruction of the Lord. Now, again, there's very little that's written about parenting or what a good father or mother should be like. Isn't it interesting? This is what he says. Don't provoke your children um, to anger, right? Um, uh, so just in the verse before this, he says he assumes that children are going to obey their parents. But when he addresses the fathers, he urges not the exercise of that authority, forcing them to do it, but the restraint of it. Um, our Christian fathers are to be like the heavenly father, nurturing, patient, caring, servant-hearted, other person-centered, not impatient, strict, inconsistent, harsh, um, and, and so on. Um, don't provoke your children to anger. Don't make them angry because of your unwise and inconsistent use of your, your authority. Now, as I say that, let me confess my own sins. I'm a failure in this area. It's so easy to get angry with, with our children, isn't it? To not be to not be gentle as we should be. Um, but this is really important, I think. I think some, some fathers are so forceful, so intimidating, so inflexible, so harsh, so distant, so angry, that they actually cause deep hurts to their children and it alienates their children from them and from God. Um, I've ministered to a lot of young adults over the years and I've seen the disastrous impact of absent, angry, and sometimes abusive fathers and a good parent will do more than just command their children to do things with no explanation and no discussion authoritative authoritarian parenting it may get outward conformity because they're so afraid of you but it won't win their hearts it won't change them in the long term and they will comply when they have no choice but when they grow up they will withdraw and they'll leave maybe the home but maybe also the church and christianity as well. So it's really important in our parenting that um, we are like the Heavenly Father who we profess um, to, uh, to follow. So Paul Tripp has written a great book on parenting. Again, I'd commend it to you. And uh, he says, parents who know they need grace tend to want to give grace to children who would just like them. So the goal then um, is we are seeking to uh, bring them up in the training and uh, the discipline and instruction uh, of the Lord. So in other words, it's not just about academics and sports and having a comfortable house and, and life. Again, it's, the Bible says very little about parenting. In the book of Ephesians, we've got one verse on parenting, right? Um, of course, there's lots of things in the Bible we can apply to parenting. The best parenting books will do that. But here's the single one main point that we really just need to take from today. And that is that parents, and in particular fathers, are to make it their primary goal that their children will know Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus, 
grow to maturity in Jesus. Um, that's all that matters in the end, you see. Um, uh, we get so caught up on all the worldly stuff that we miss this main point of what godly parenting is about. We're so worried about planning our children's education, taking them to tuition classes, making them learn all the languages, um, taking them to the hobbies, you know, the piano, the swimming, the, um, the sports or whatever it, whatever it may be. We, we, we want to give our children the best life we can. So we work hard. So we give them a good house, lots of clothes. They've got every of the latest toys. And of course we mean well, and they're all good things, but the Bible is not concerned about any of those things. Um, and an approach like that to parenting, it's not really distinctly Christian at all, because that's exactly what our non-Christian neighbors and friends are doing as well in their parenting. Right? Um, so here is that, here is our goal. We want to bring them up to know Jesus. Yeah? And it talks about discipline here. So we're actively teaching them the right way to go. We're correcting them when they go astray. We're forming their character. Um, discipline's essential. We're not just saying to our children, look, you just make up your own minds about everything, uh, whether it's about how they live or what they believe. No, we have a goal in parenting and we're actively heading towards that, that goal. We're, we, we're disciplining them um, and we are instructing them. And of course, that means we need to know God's word for ourselves so that we can, we can pass it on. And uh, maybe some of us have, it's been a while since we've actually tried to dig deeply into God's word. Um, and maybe here's another encouragement. You only can get, give them what you've got. Um, and so maybe, it's an, uh, uh, maybe now is a good time to, to dig again into God's word so that you can teach them. So what I'm saying is the most important thing that we need to pass on in our families is not money, it's not education, it's not a better life, it's the gospel of Jesus. Okay? And we want to be deliberate. We want to be intentional um, in doing that. And, and, and see then that discipling our family is our first and primary responsibility um, before uh, any other responsibility that we, that we have. Now, how do we do this? And uh, let me just give the overview. And then after the break, we'll come back and we'll look at this in more detail. So how do we do it? Prayer. Prayer is very important because one of the first things you work out as a parent is that you're not really in control. <laughs> like to think that you are, but you're not really, are you? I mean, from the very beginning, um, even if you decide you want children, it doesn't mean that you're going to get children, isn't it? It's a gift of God. The timing, even when you can, are they going to be healthy or not? It's not really in your control. How are they going to grow up to be? Are they going to grow up to know Jesus or not? It's not really in your control. So prayer from the very beginning is very important. Teaching, uh, modeling, and, and, and all of life. So we'll unpack those things in a moment. But just one final point before we do, and that is, even though I'm emphasizing that the primary responsibility is the parents, um, there is also a place for the church as well. Right? So we come back to Ephesians 4. It says here, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So they say it takes a village to raise a child. There's a lot of wisdom in that. And uh, I might alter that and say, well, it takes a church to raise a Christian child. And Yes, we never diminish the responsibility of parents, but we never do it alone. It's really important that we bring up our family in the community of the church um, where the whole body can speak the truth in love. In other words, that they have Christian friends. They go to Sunday school. Um, they go to youth. They can talk to other Christian people apart from us. Um, that's really important um, in helping them to grow Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's pick up the questions first and uh, we'll get back to the material after I've finished all the questions here. Um, so I'll just pick up uh, uh, Edith's question first. So one of the struggles she says is about not putting them on a scale, figuring out where they're at all the time, thinking, feeling guilty that, uh, that they're falling away. 
I mean, that's one of the, that's, that is a, a real struggle, isn't it? Is that um, once we know that we have this responsibility to bring up our children to know Christ, then um, we can um, put a lot of pressure on ourselves to, to make it happen. And, and, and it, that's why it's so important to remember that, 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 that God is sovereign. It's, it is a heartbreaking experience when um, our children seem to be going away from Jesus. Um, some of us here may have experienced that right now. Maybe you have a child um, or another family member who's born away from Christ. Um, uh, some of you would, would know of uh, John Piper um, and uh, you know, written so many books. And in fact, he started a whole ministry called Truth 78 about discipling the next generation of, of children. It's a fantastic ministry. You can check it out, Truth 78. But one of his own sons um, has um, you know, left, left the faith and is putting all these videos on YouTube. I think he's got more followers on YouTube now than his father does on, on, on Twitter. But his father's teaching about Christ and his son is telling, telling them why how um you know growing up in a christian family and reading the bible and so on was 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 really awful and terrible and you should never do it and it's hard it's heartbreaking for him and anyone who's uh, gone through that themselves will will know the same thing and i guess that, that, that comes back to the point that i was saying is that in the end that's what matters isn't it uh, i mean if you, you can give them the best education and money in the house and but if they don't know Jesus in the end, then that the heartache of that is just, yeah, it, it's so difficult. So we need to remember that God is sovereign. And I didn't read Ephesians 1, but Ephesians 1 talks about how God predestines, um, chooses before the foundation of the world. And then even in Ephesians um, 2, we're saved by grace. It's God's work. Faith is the gift of God. And even the good works are prepared beforehand. So in the end, is God is sovereign. That doesn't diminish our responsibility, but we just recognize that we can't make our children be Christian. And you can do all the right things um, and, um, and they can still reject it. And um, so what do you do? You pray um, to the Heavenly Father to change them. And if... Um, you know, if they're, and you pray all the way through, you pray that that will never happen to them. Um, you pray even before they're born, that they'll grow up to know Jesus. And you don't stop praying because you recognize it's ultimately, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's God's work. So, um, yeah, I think it, rem reminding ourselves of God's sovereignty is, is, is the only way that we'll be able to avoid the deep, the, the deep guilt, anxiety, and um, insecurity that otherwise will come about. Um, with, our, with our children. Um, uh, so someone else, uh, someone else writes this, how to nurture my child's heart to love God's word more than the pleasures and entertainment of the world from YouTube, online gaming, etc. That That's a great question. In fact, I just read an article a couple of days ago and um, it said that uh, children, that found that children spend on average 40% of their waking hours on a screen. 40%. Now, some of that will be at school, but most of that will be, will, will be at home. Um, so if they're spending 40% of the time on, on screen, not only are they going to, probably going to go blind, right? Um, it's going to affect their social skills and a lot of other things, but probably contribute to depression, all of, all of the studies that have talked about that. But not only of those things, but what's the voice that they're hearing? They're not hearing the discipling from their parents. They're hearing that they're being discipled by, um, by the screen. So it is very important at a young age to limit screen time. Um, and uh, as they grow up to talk about it, um, how, how do you use social media rightly? And to be very to think very carefully about whether you give them their own device and things like that. And uh, I think I don't plan to give my <laughs> children, like, you know, smartphones and things like that until they're much, much, much older. So I, yeah, it, it is a hard, it's a hard topic, but I think in, number one is we need to think carefully about how much screen time they're, they're exposed to. Um, and, and then secondly, to actually model and talk about um, how do you actually use it? Um, 
and how can, how can you use it well and how can you use it um, dangerously. Um, so feel free to, to come back if you want to ask um, more about that. Uh, probably one more point I'd add though is, of course, it's your model that will be a big factor in it. Right? So, I mean, if you yourself is always on your phone and on the TV and then that's that that's obviously how your children is going to follow uh, follow suit as well. So your children will know what you love and care about. They will observe that very quickly. Um, so as they observe your heart for God's word, your heart for Christ, um, that would be a big factor in, in them having the same uh, kind of heart. So what about you have a different faith journey between the husband and the wife, different priorities and practices. Again, that's, that's going to be a very, very, very challenging um, situation, um, especially if the husband's the non-believer. It's going to be very, very, very um, difficult. Now, it's not impossible. I mean, it's interesting in those two Timothy passages where um, Paul mentions about how it was uh, Eunice and, uh, and so on who brought up Timothy to know Christ. Why didn't he mention his father? Um, his father's mentioned in Acts as a Greek. Um, maybe he wasn't a believer. So, um, yeah, so there's no, we, we can still do the best that we can, um, even if we're the only parent that's Christian um, to, to teach and to bring to Sunday school. But of course, yeah, there's going to be many, many, many challenges. Um, what does it look like to be a Christian wife with a non-Christian husband? I think 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3 talks a bit about that, about showing Christ through your good works and so on. But it is going to be very difficult in the decision-making process about things. So pray, 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 pray. Live it out yourself the best that you can. Um, at some point, they'll grow up and, 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 and be able to make decisions. And um, hopefully you can be the great influence um, in, in their life. Uh, how do we ensure time to read the Bible and pray with spouse or children without turning it into legalism or becoming lax in spiritual discipline? Yeah, I, 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 I just try to say just have a small goal and just try and stick at it as much as you can. If you, if you fail, just, just try again, you know, ask for forgiveness, try again. And um, do my wife, are, are my wife and I able to have a, you know, a half an hour Bible study every day? <laughs> no, we, we, we don't. We've got four children under six. Um, we, we, we both read the Bible ourselves at some point in the day. Um, uh, we try and talk about it where we can, um, what, what each other's been learning. But the, the times when we're able to read together, it, it's very challenging now. Uh, we, we did at one point get into a nice routine where we would, try and read the Bible over breakfast and um, while the other kids were at school, but then online, online schooling came and that threw that out. And um, so that, that's, that's the challenge of being parenting, isn't it? I mean, it's, we find it hard enough to find five minutes in the day to talk about anything, let alone <laughs> to, to do the Bible study. So uh, it's not about being legalistic. It's just about trying to do something. And if the something is just you open the Bible, you read half a chapter, um, and uh, you say, what's one thing you, you got from that? I share what's one thing I got, and we pray, and the whole thing takes five minutes. That's great, you know. It's, we've heard God's word, we've prayed about it together, we've said something. I think don't despise the, the small things. And if you're able to do more and you have a, have a, have a, you know, have a deliberate time together and, and, and all of that, that it's going to be all the better for it. Um, but Remember that it's meant to be a, a delight and a relationship. It's not just a kind of a box to um, to, to, to tick off. Yeah. Uh, someone asked about uh, the uh, grace pace parenting. Any practical advices? Yeah, I can give a few things there. Uh, so, one of the important aspects of being of grace based parenting is is the idea of unconditional love, and um, it's it's easy as a parent to communicate that your love is conditional. Yeah. If you do this, then I will love you. If you do your homework, I'll love you. If you do the, yeah. So the, the classic example of this is the child that gets home from school with, you know, 90, got 99 on their maths exam and then the parents say to them, Where, where's the other, 
one percent why didn't you get a hundred and um that child's going to grow up isn't it with this not really sure their parents love them and trying to earn their parents love i, I know a, a real story of someone who um for every every mark they lost in their their test they got caned by their by their father um uh, horrific horrific kind of situation now of course this person grew up being very smart and excelling but it was very damaging to them um, to have such uh, conditionality. So yeah, it's, it's, un, it's unconditional love and children will um, feel most secure and safe when they know that you love them even when they messed up. So even when you're disciplining them, putting them in timeout or saying you've got no TV for a week, um, reminding them that you know, I, I, after the discipline or during the discipline, I still, I still love you and thank you. Thank you. That you're in your family. Other things, uh, well, grace will be uh, will mean uh, giving them freedom to be um, different, right? freedom to be vulnerable. Um, we're not overly reactive to to their immature emotions. Freedom to be candid. Right? Um, we allow them to express their disappointment with things without necessarily attacking them. We, we give them freedom to make mistakes. All of those things will be aspects of showing um, unconditional love. It doesn't mean there's no boundaries. It doesn't mean that we, um, yeah, we intimidate them through, um, through punishment. Right? Um, but yeah, the, we're, we're aiming. So there are boundaries, there is discipline, but even in and through that, we, we're communicating um, uh, unconditional love. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the other questions hopefully at the end. I think I'd, I'd better just press on with the, the rest of the materials first. Okay, right, so yeah, so, uh, so how do we actually go about it? We thought about the why, what about the how? Uh, so prayer, pray for your children and with your children. Uh, children will learn prayer from how you pray with them. Uh, tell them what you're praying for them. It's really interesting how Paul does that in his letters, isn't it, when he... When he, uh, when he writes to the different churches, he tells them what he's praying. And I think that's a great thing to do with our children. And then you can tell them, you know, I'm praying for you that you'll be able to be more patient with your brother or that you'll learn how to control your emotions more, that you will um, know how precious you are to Jesus and find your identity in him and not your outward appearance or what, whatever it is. Um, uh, you can ask them what they would like prayer for and use that as a, as a teaching moment. Um, we will usually pray with our kids before we drop them off to school. And sometimes we will ask yeah, anything that we can, we can pray for. And they might say something and we might say, that's a great thing to pray, but we could also pray this because um, this might be even more important than that. Uh, so you can use that prayer time to teach them various things. So prayer, prayer is a really good one. Uh, now, teaching, um, I think we want to have a set time where we read the Bible and pray daily. Um, it, it doesn't have to be long. Um, I think the consistency is the key here. Uh, it can vary for different ages and stages. Um, as in, we might sometimes read with all the children together. Sometimes we might read separately. Um, we might move them towards having their own devotional time. We might try and do something as a family um, so it, it can look different for different ages and stages and, and so on um, i'm just saying i think it's really it's really important that it's there in some form uh, yeah and, and 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 modeling with this is important so if we come back to the ephesians 6 where it says fathers you know um, bring up your children well one of the ways that we communicate this to our children is that is uh, my wife will say baba's home then he leads the he leads the devotion. Um, now, I'm home most of the time, but if I was traveling or whatever and I wasn't, then she would do it or for whatever reason. But it's not that she can't do it. But if I'm home, I will do it because I want to I want to lead the family in that in, in that way. Um, so I thought maybe it's probably helpful to just talk about some of the specifics here because we all, we all come from different contexts and maybe we just we don't know how to do it. So maybe uh, 
we say talk about having a devotion time. It, it, uh, you could have all kinds of things that come into your mind. Um, one factor to think about here, I guess, is the routine. And uh, I, uh, I found it helpful to think about bath, Bible, bed. <laughs> and it's the same every day. Yeah. We'll have dinner after dinner. You know, dinner for us is about six o'clock because we try to get our bed, kids down to bed early. Dinner at six. The bath will be about seven. Right? The, the Bible time will be about 7.30. And we're aiming to get them in bed by you know, 8, 8.30. I say aiming because, of course, <laughs> the routine gets frequently uh, thrown off and it, it almost never will follow that exact pattern. <laughs> but that's what we're aiming for. And, and, and we're so consistent with it that the kids understand it. And um, so if you, if you tried to skip any element of that, um, they just wouldn't allow it. They say, you've, you've forgotten to pray or you forgot. It's bath time now. It's seven o'clock. Look, it's bath time. We need to go and have our bath. They, they're just so fixed in the routine. And this is especially the case for young children, um, which is what I've got, is that uh, routine helps children feel, um, feel safe and, and secure and, and uh, because it brings some control to their, um, to their world. Um, for us, we work, we work from the youngest to the oldest, um, partly because we aim to have the youngest in bed first. Um, uh, and so we tend not to do it together. Um, we tend to do like the devotion for one child and then the next and then the next and then the next, right? Um, the advantages of that is it can be age appropriate. So what's gonna look like to read with a one-year-old and six-year-old is obviously gonna be very different. Um, we also do that because I think there's great value in trying to spend one-on-one -on -one time with, with children. And when you have a bigger family like ours, then um, it can be quite struggle to have those one-on-one -on -one times, but it's really, really important. Um, so that's what we do. Now, what do we do with my, my youngest? My youngest is four months. Uh, we've got four kids. So it's been quite a struggle to actually start his devotions early. Um, so to this point, we haven't done a lot with him at four months. Um, but with when our other children were the same age, we did. Right? Um, you can actually, you can't start too early. I think you can, you can start reading to them when they're still in the womb, you know, <laughs> or, or, or even when they're a baby. They might not understand anything that you are saying. <laughs> but it's partly about, establishing the routine uh, it's partly about teaching them to love books because they just love um, you know love touching love seeing the pictures and and love being with their parents doing that it becomes something that is um, that's precious for them even if they can't they can't say it or understand it so I think if, if the earlier you start the more likely that it's going to be successful later on. I mean, some of you will know this. I think there's, there was a question in the chat, you know, that maybe you haven't done a devotion with them or had any Bible input for X number of years, either because you just didn't do it or because you became Christians later. I mean, how do I start now? And, you know, because it's going to be awkward and weird. And yes, it is. <laughs> it is going to be weird. It is going to be awkward. Um, but you've just got to start, isn't it? And uh, the more that you keep doing it, eventually it will stop being awkward and weird. It will just become, it'll become more normal. Um, but the easiest way to avoid that situation is to just start when, they, when they're very young. Uh, so what about for my, uh, my next child? He's, he's two. So I've, I brought some of the kids' Bibles that we have. We've got loads of them. Right? Um, I think the key for the very young, uh, for the very young children is to, uh, it has to be very, very simple. Right? So this, is, this has been a great one for him from very young. It's called Pointing Bible. It's not Bible stories. It's basically just pictures. Can you, can you see that? Um, and you're just learning, you're just learning words, really. Um, uh, God, earth, God made the world. Um, so I'll say, you know, where's God? And he'll point. 
I know we don't know what God looks like and so on. So the new version of this doesn't have a picture of God in it, but <laughs> leave that discussion for another time. All right, well, where, where's the animals? You know, where's, where's the giraffe? Where's the whatever? And he'll, he'll point to them. You know, God made those. Where's Adam and Eve? Um, where, you know, there's the slippery snake. And, you know, can they eat the fruit? And he will say, we always do this in Chinese. We say, quite done. <laughs> naughty, naughty children. You know, where's there's Noah? And it's very interactive because he's always, every picture, he's, he's pointing, he's saying the words. Now, uh, eventually it gets to, you know, gets to Jesus, the baby. And often we'll, we'll do songs. We'll do songs at nearly every, at nearly every story here. You know, here's King David. And we'll sing the simple immune music song. King David, King David was God's chosen king. Now that song's got a whole few verses and so on. Usually we might just do one line. <laughs> um, twinkle, twinkle, little star, or we three kings of Orient, uh, whatever you like. <laughs> um, uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. Um, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> right, so it's very interesting. It's, it's pointing, there's a lot of, we do actions. Jesus is riding on the donkey. Jesus is dying on the cross. Jesus is alive. And then you always say, pray, pray. <laughs> and you'll go, because it's, it's the same every time. Uh, and uh, they just memorize it all the time. And the prayer will be the same pretty much every time. Dear Father God, thank you that you made us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Right. And there are variations on this, you know, this is a baby's Bible, you know, kind of similar kind of thing. Um, something that you can read through in one go. I quite like this one, ABC Story Bible, not only because they get to learn their ABC along the way. <laughs> it's every time we, we sing an ABC song at the start. Um, but yeah, he'll go through every, every time. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. Everything was beautiful in God's world. You always point to the whale for that. And everything was cursed. God promised to send a deliverer. He'll point to the baby. Um, God raised up Moses, put up our hands. God sent flies. Bzzz. God sent gnats. Mama, mama, mama. God sent hail. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> but a lot of action, sounds, and so on. And um, and this is a good kind of Bible overview in in ABC. So I mean, at the start, that's what you're that's what you're doing. It's it's very it's very simple, and those are not even really Bible stories, are they? I mean, um, uh, eventually you want to try and get to something like this, and this is probably the, you know, the best Bible for really, really young kids, like an actual Bible. But at not even two years old, um, my son can't really concentrate for a, a simple story like this. Um, this is my daughter's favorite story for very, very long about Mary and Martha. And you can see it's basically just got one or two lines on each page with whatever. Mary, Martha and their brother Lazarus were friends with Jesus. One day Jesus came over to visit. Mary sat at his feet and listened to him for a long time. Meanwhile, Martha was busy cleaning. There was so much to do. Some of, this, some of the mothers can identify with that. Uh, the longer Mary listened to Jesus, the madder Martha got. She said, I'm busy in the kitchen while Mary's doing nothing. Jesus, tell my sister to help me, Martha whines. Martha, Martha, said Jesus, you should not be upset. Mary has chosen what is better. She's listening to me. So it's very short. Um, and once you get to this kind of, once they can cope with a short story like that, you can just go, um, just aim for one story, uh, one story a night. Um, now, I guess as you as you move on, it's just kind of seeing when their level reaches a certain level, then you can you can just upgrade to something that's um, that that's harder and harder. Um, so there's, um, there's there's loads of kids' Bibles out there. I mean, I've probably bought most of them, <laughs> um, but they 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 just get harder as you go. So um, you know, this is quite a, another good one that's. We'll, we'll take you through the, the big story of the Bible. There's also an audio book that comes with this, which is quite, quite, quite good. So again, a lot of pictures, not many words. Um, 
Uh, we'll give you an overview. Uh, Jesus Storybook Bible is quite good. Again, starting to get starting to get more words and more more uh, more theology in it. Um, then maybe you get to beginners story Bible. Even someone four years old, three four years old could, could four years old maybe I think I read this with my with my son. Um, really really great one. And then when you hit about five or six, I think they've got the gospel story Bible. So that was the beginners, the beginners gospel story Bible. This is gospel story Bible. And now the text is getting more, right? The pictures is what's well, got a picture. It's got some discussion questions there, um, but it's, it's still just one, one page a day. Now, even at one page a day, it's 150 chapters. So this, this will take half a year to go through it. Um, uh, once my daughter had gone through that, um, we moved up to the next one. We went to this one. This is a really old one. I don't even know where I got this from. Um, I think someone gave this to my wife when she wasn't a Christian yet, I, I think. Um, and this has got 300 and, 365 stories, and uh, it follows pretty closely on the Bible. And sometimes I read this, and I think, is that in the Bible? I don't remember reading that in the Old Testament. And sure enough, it's, it's there, you know. <laughs> uh, and eventually what you're, you're hoping to do is actually get them to a, to a real Bible. Um, uh, we've almost got there with my six-year-old girl, but not, not quite. Um, this, at the moment, we, we're reading this one um, because we've, she's read all of them, even that 365-day one. I think she's read that twice. Um, so th this one is the kind of comic, comic one. And at this point, I'm reading this with my, with, with, with the, my eldest two together. Um, and this is quite long as well. Probably got a couple more months left on this one. And, and then eventually you, you'll get to an actual kid's Bible, um, probably a CEV or something like that um, is a good place to start. This is a CEV translation Bible. Um, so it's a full, you know, it's a full, it's a full Bible, right? Um, with, with no pictures. So usually this is, at some point they're going to start reading. I mean, my girl starts read, started reading about six. So once you can start reading for yourself, you start reading books that don't really have pictures. And, and that's an ideal time to move to a proper um, kind, of, kind of Bible. So yeah, that, that, that's the devotion time. And, you know, our devotions, they will, they will vary in length a lot. Um, sometimes they will just be, I, I mean, going through the, those little ones with my young youngest, it might take two minutes, you know, or three minutes. It's, it, that's about the limit of his attention span. Even with the old, older ones, it might just take five minutes. Um, sometimes it'll take half an hour um, because uh, they'll ask a question or we'll research something. So for example, um, there, there, was a, there was a map in one of them that mentioned a place, I think it was Megiddo or something. We didn't know where that was. It looked like it was near the beach. So we went onto Google and, and oh, okay. It's actually quite a nice little holiday spot. And there's still some ruins there. Uh, we were reading about um, Cyrus sending the exiles home. And so we, we Googled and we looked up the Cyrus cylinder where, you know, where the edict is written in the London Museum or, um, you know, we'll look at what a Bible manuscript looks like and, um, or whatever, because I, I, I want them to know that it's real places, real people, real events. They could go there, they could see the things, um, and, or, or we'll talk about apologetic issues. What about other religions or what about, yeah. So, or, or application for their lives. So it, it might be five minutes. And if they're really tired and they're grumpy and they're fighting with each other, then it might be less. Um, but if it's a, you know, it's a good night and there's questions and so on, then it, it, it might be more. So it's not planned, it's not prepared, it's spontaneous, but we have a, we're, we're curious to study God's word um, together, to understand it together. Sometimes they wanna read a second story and we do. Uh, very occasionally, so chaotic, we don't even get through one. I don't think it matters. Um, it's, it's just about the consistency of it. So we'll read the Bible and then we'll pray. 
And the prayer might be, like I said, dear Father God, thank you. You made us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> um, uh, or I might just say a short prayer in response to the passage. Um, but it might be longer, you know. It might be we, we share prayer points. We pray for some issue that's coming up. We, um, it all depends. Generally, intentionality is good. Creativity is good. You know, if you want to make a print out some photos or something of different family members, and, and or missionaries and you go through one folder a day and pray for them you know i think that's kind of things great and works but we tend to just keep it keep it simple uh what else can you do well of course you can do singing uh, either part of the devotion time itself or um what we tend to do these days is we just sing a few songs before we put them to bed we tend to repeat the same songs um so that they get them um uh, at other times, we've we've done the creeds, the Lord's Prayer. Um, we print them out on pieces of paper and we say them. At one point, my two-year-old son could recite the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the grace. Um, eventually, they got sick of doing it every night, so we stopped. And guess what? Then they forgot it. <laughs> so that, I mean, that, that just teaches you something as, as well, isn't it? If you don't keep repeating it, then you lose it. Um, but it does show you, even at two years old, you can you can memorize the Apostles' Creed um, or do memory verses. Um, these these kind of things. Uh, another thing we've done is, uh, is try and work out how to do things at the dinner table. Now, for us, generally now it's quite chaotic, so we don't do don't do anything apart from say grace. But for a time, we were working through these books. This one's called Everything a Child Should Know About God, and it's a doctrinal book. Reading the Bible is important. Short story and a question. Take one minute to read it. Next day, read the, ne read the next one. Prophets wrote the Bible. God is kind. Um, we all have sin in our hearts. It's a, it's a doctrinal book, but it, um, yeah. And, and it has a companion one which goes through everyone a child should know. And so it's got people like, yeah, there's John Calvin there. I guess it was predestined I'd open to that page. <laughs> William Carey uh, or whatever. Um, yeah, so we've gone through that kind of thing. So it, it's interesting. I mean, you might just read it. The whole thing takes one minute, but it might lead to a, a, a conversation or, 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 or whatever. And I guess a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, family ministries like that. You have some intentionality and you have some content. If you're doing it regularly, then it will lead to, um, to, to other uh, opportunities. Um, okay, yeah, so I think that's, you know, there's, there's some tips for the, the actual Bible time. Now, eventually you want to get them to read the Bible for themselves. I think it's really interesting for, like my wife would try and read the Bible when she has breakfast and, um, it's got to the point where my my daughter loves to just sit with her with her own while and read the same passage and do it do it together. Um, so there, that shows that the modelling is really important, and, um, and 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 she's she's picking it up just by watching my my wife do it. So eventually, that's where you're aiming to get to, right? Is that they'll do it for themselves, um, but you, you're giving a lot of the input in the early days. Uh, in the car is a good another good place listening to uh, music at the moment my son his favorite song at the moment is called a very special tent by ben ben pakula and uh you probably haven't heard of him he's not the most famous kind of kids music guy but he's great look him up ben pakula and uh, he has a he has a, a one of the songs is called a very special tent and it's all about how you know, Israel had a tabernacle and Jesus is the true temple. And now we are God's temple. He lives in us. And eventually we'll be in heaven with him in, in, the, in the tent of tabernacle of heaven. And he loves the song probably because of the music and song. But he'll, he'll come up with these statements. He's four years old, right? And he'll say, did you know, Baba, that Jesus is the true temple? <laughs> did you know that Jesus is our great high priest? Um, did you know he was sacrificed for our sins? <laughs> um, and that's the power of, 
that's the power of song. He's like, well, do you know what it means that he's our great high priest or that he's the true temple? Well, he doesn't. Um, there's an opportunity to have that. Um, so the other, the other great thing about car rides, of course, is conversations. It's that you can, you can just talk about things as things come up. If you say, you know, how was school today? And I probably say, it was great. What did you do? You say, I can't remember. <laughs> but if they do actually um, tell you something, um, they say, you know, I was sad because my friend didn't want to play with me today and I felt hurt or whatever. Then there's an opportunity to disciple them. Okay, how as a Christian do we think about that? And can we still love them even though they hurt us? Can we forgive them? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities just in the everyday kind of conversations if we're intentional about it. Uh, someone asked about, uh, you know, how do you, how do you redeem you know, TV and computer games? There is, of course, Superbook. Um, if you've never discovered Superbook, highly recommend that. There's a Bible app for kids, which is also quite good. But this, this is more for young, um, young kids. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, I, I recommend those to you. All right, so we've thought about we've thought about prayer. We've thought about uh, teaching. The next point I want to go on to is is modeling. I'll share my slides again. And this is really key, isn't it? Um, it's not just about what you say or what you teach, but ultimately it's about what you do, isn't it? Um, you can talk all you like about to a child about why they should read the Bible and pray, but if you never do it, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so you've got to model it. Um, they need to see you sitting at the breakfast table with your Bible open or praying or whatever it is. I mean, why does my son say that being a good father means you need to write sermons? <laughs> because he's come into my room during lockdowns and seen me writing a lot of, a lot of sermons. It's been, it's been modeled to him and there's been opportunities to talk about why am I doing it and and why do we preach to people and these kind of things? Um, so modeling faithfulness in word and prayer, modeling repentance and faith, not just hypocrisy. Um, so some parents never want to show their weakness or their fault. Um, I don't know how many times that I apologize to my children, a lot. <laughs> I say, sorry, I was too angry. I was impatient. Sorry, I didn't listen to you well. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. Um, doing that a lot. That, that, that's really important, isn't it? Because um, it shows humility and, and, and you're, you're actually living out the, the, the gospel. Um, moral ministry, not self-centeredness. So as they see you going to do something for someone else or giving away something or visiting someone in the hospital um, or whatever it is, they, they will observe, you know, why, why is it that you struggle every week to prepare this Sunday school lesson or to go to, to do this one-to-one? -one? Um, they will observe. And, um, yeah, your, your own commitment to going to church and to, to ministry. So it's not just about what you say, it's what you do. Okay? Um, our children watch all that we do, um, and that's a good thing. Um, because it gives us an opportunity to show what the Christian life looks like, but it can be a bad thing if we're a hypocrite. So I guess that leads into the next point, uh, uh, which I think might be my last point, and that is that it's uh, it's it's all of life, isn't it? It's um it's life on life, and it's all of life, right? uh, and that's reflected really well in this passage from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. These words I command you today shall be on your heart. So there's a great summary of the, of the law, isn't it? Love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and these you shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall find them as a sign on your hand. They shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other, in other words, what it's reminding us is we just can't limit our family ministry to a five-minute devotion. Right? If, that's great, and it's fundamental, but all discipleship is life on life and all of life. Um, 
when you are eating meals. Um, the research says that um, eating dinner with your children is one of the most important things you can do. You know, they'll be less likely to take drugs and to have bad friends and to get depression and just by eating dinner with them. <laughs> um, but eating dinner and talking about things, um, playing games with them um, you know, while you're driving in the car, spending time. And, and the point here is it's not just about, people say you need to spend quality time, not quantity time. But the thing is, you don't get quality time without quantity of time. I mean, you, the, you, they're only going to ask you the, that question or say make that statement if you've been spending a lot of time with them doing other things. Right? Parenting can't be rushed. Quality conversations can't be forced. Right? It requires a lot of time and a lot of intent, uh, intentionality and effort. So we, I guess we need to remember this, that we can't disciple our children when we're always at work. Um, or if they sleep before we get home, or you're at home, but you're watching TV instead of talking to them. This is maybe anecdotal. I can't remember where I heard this, but uh, one researcher in America found that most children watch three to four hours of television a day, but spend less than 15 minutes in conversation with their fathers. Um, but you can't disciple your children like that, can you? Because you're not spending any time with them. The TV is discipling them at that point. Um, so yes, you are, you're spending time um, and as you do, you're explaining the Christian life. Um, this works not just for parenting, but ministry in general. Um, as you're seeking to coach someone, um, why are you doing what you are doing? Um, explain your reasons. Explain your, 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 your thoughts. How, and how are you feeling as you go about um, doing this? Because in the end, our children are much more likely to remember who we were than what we taught them. Are they going to remember any of the devotions that I gave them? Probably not. <laughs> they might remember some of the songs we sang. But what they will remember, did I spend time with them or not? Did I love them? What kind of a father was I? Was I gracious or was I angry? Um, was I there for them when they were crying? Um, those are the kind of moments they're going to remember, isn't it? They're going to remember who we were towards them and not just what we taught them. Discipleship's all of life and it's, it's life on, on life. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Um, and uh, would you like to ask any, uh, any questions as we think about these things? Oh, okay. Any thoughts on discipling teenage children? Yeah. Uh, I was just I was just re-listening to a, a, a podcast episode on that just before I, before I came here because um, you know my my children are only up to six years old so I, I can't speak necessarily from my personal experience on that it's not in the handout I just put in the chat um, some of the podcast episodes Crossway podcasts is, uh, um, they 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 meet up with different authors of books and. Um, and, and, and talk through the content of it. And they have a number of ones on parenting and family discipleship. You can see the uh, parenting, the light of the gospel, how to intentionally disciple your kids. That's the one I was listening to, which is about, um, they were focusing on teenagers for that one. How to do family discipleship during the holidays, how to create a plan for family worship, how to use stories to help kids understand the gospel, family discipleship 101. I've, I've listened to all of those in the past. There's a lot of gold um, within those. So uh, I, I direct you to those to think about this, this more. But I guess uh, when teenagers can be hard work from what I've heard. <laughs> um, generally, the better you go as a, when they're young, the more you're able to address issues when they're young, the easier it is to address them when they're teenagers, that's what I'm told. So a lot of the questions will come up early. So for example, um, my, my daughter was, had a conversation with my um, wife just this week, she's six, right? Um, she was saying, she was explaining to her that she, she always likes to wear long pants instead of um, uh, uh, as well as her, whatever dress she's wearing, right? Because she doesn't like people to see the mosquito bites on her legs, right? Um, 
body image, six years old. Yeah. Now, of course, that's going to be, become a very prominent issue when she's a teenager, but it, it comes up early. Um, and I think, I think most issues like, are, are like that. Um, issues of, you'll know what they are, you know, it's for, for, for girls, body image, identity, um, relationships, things like that. Um, and, um, you know, for, for, for boys or the, the pride performance, um, competitiveness and all of these things, you know, they, they come out when they're young and then they just become more extreme when they're older. So one, um, one way is to just be really intentional trying to deal with the questions early and not thinking that they're too young to, to start thinking about them. Um, but, you know, what if they're already teenagers? Um, so I guess you're, you're, you want to work really hard at um, being able to create a relationship that they feel that they're able to talk to you. I know that a lot of teenagers don't want to talk to their parents about what's going on, but to the extent that you're able to build relationship with them and trust them so that when they share something with you, you don't just judge them or shout them down or whatever, but they feel safe to talk to you about things. Um, it'll be all the better for it because then you're able to coach them as they go through the social media thing. And um, as you know, they you know, whenever they get exposed to pornography or, I mean, you want them to be the, they want you want them to tell you first right if they get exposed to something like that or this, they're being bullied at school or you don't really want to hear through the teachers or something else um but it's it's working really hard to um, help them to feel um, accepted and to be able to talk to you and to tell to tell the truth um and and, and maybe that involves also being vulnerable yourself and yeah, really working hard at that unconditional love. Um, so I, I, I would say that's probably the, the, the key or the heart to it, but maybe other parents who are able to, who've been through the teenage phase would be able to add on to that. Um, and then the other thing that is often said with teenagers is, is just pray. Um, you know, it might feel really hard, but it will end eventually. <laughs> um, so if you can just keep loving them, even when they don't want to spend time with you or don't talk to you or whatever, so long as you don't drive them away during those times by being really strict and, um, uh, and harsh with them, then eventually they'll come back to you when they hit their 20s. Um, but it's, it's an exercise in faith parenting, isn't it? Trusting God so hard. Uh, Tim, we have a couple of questions around uh, screen times. So, yeah. um, so I think the questions are talking about, you know, how do you manage screen times? Uh, what time? When do you start exposing kids to screen time? And I think even from just looking at some of the questions, also you can be speaking to, you know, how do you balance screen time, physical books? Uh, uh, what what's the? Uh, maybe you can get some insights on on some thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of research done on this, obviously. Um, generally, the rule is before they're two years old, zero screen time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, even, yeah, excessive screen time, especially for young children, is linked to, it limits creativity, it leads to social problems, it's a, it's a key factor in causing depression, and um, it affects even academic development. Um, and a lot of a lot of things. That's the research. Um, so, of course, they want to play on your phone because they see you playing on your phone. But yeah, basically zero screen time before before two. Uh, but you, eventually, you've got to be able to expose them to things and talk through with them about what's appropriate and what's um, what's not. So, I mean, our kids love to watch Paw Patrol and. Um, you know, <laughs> all, all the other, all the shows, but it's about limiting, right? So, um, you know, it's 20 minutes once a day. Um, um, yeah, or, you know, one super book or whatever. So I think it's okay to watch non-Christian things as well as Christian things as well. Um, but you've, you've got to be very judicious about what you allow them to, to see and, and how much. Um, yeah, if they watch too much, also they'll wreck their eyes. So the um, uh, the 
yeah, optometrist was telling me recently that the, the shop was basically full of children because they've all been at home doing online classes and everything, and it has destroyed their eyes. <laughs> so for every reason you want to limit it and you've just got to be, be strict. Now, as they grow up, um, there'll be different softwares and things that you can use. Which, um, I, I don't think you want to give them screens that they can watch by themselves in their own room. You should always be watching in public. Um, but even when you do, if you ever give them their own device or whatever, you don't give it without, um, you know, software that blocks bad stuff that they can't just install whatever apps that, and limits the amount of time and you know apple app iphones will have all this built into it um other phones you can download software to do it um, but it's really important that you do because otherwise they will find their way to you know pornographic material or whatever other stuff and, and social media again has been strongly linked to you know anxiety depression and Loads of other things. I'm sure you probably observed that from your own experience. So, yeah, so it's it's controlling the exposure, but then also talking about it with them, doing it with them, and talking about it with them so that um, you're able to say, why is this show helpful and why is this show not? What's the values that's being shown in this? Or why is this person posting this on social media? Why might that be helpful? Why might that be damaging? Um, Etc. Etc. So it's it's very practical teaching. Uh, one follow-up question came, Tim. What about showing them Christian songs and show us on TV or YouTube before they're two years old? Yeah, you know, has my has my uh, you know one and a half year old son ever watched TV? Yes, he has. <laughs> um, of course, it's it's it's, not, it's impossible to eliminate it fully, but in general. The less the better. Why don't you sing the song to them, um, or play the play the music and whatever? That'd be so much better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have one more question. Um, um, uh, one one person asked. Um, we are worried moving away from society and community. How do we ensure that we are in community and still living by His grace and salt and light as a family? Um, it is hard. It is very hard with the pandemic. I mean, for with young kids, we've tried to keep them home a lot. Um, and uh, but for children, just like adults, social interaction is very, 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 very important. So I mean, going to the online Sunday school and whatever is helpful to some extent, or just being able to have a Zoom with their friend is is, is helpful. But of course, that's all screen time as well. Um, so you've got to manage that. Um, yeah, but it is really important for children's development that they spend time with other children and other people. So we need to do that. And when the opportunity is to go back to, to church, I guess if anything, this pandemic has taught us the importance of real relationships and community and meeting as God's people. And we want to work out how to do that safely with our children. But it's really important that we... Um, Well, with that, I will just uh, thank you again for uh, joining the session. I would uh, like to pass back to Tim, maybe just to close us in prayer then. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, being our, our Heavenly Father. And uh, we thank you that you love us unconditionally, that you sent your son to um, die for our sins. Thank you for your grace. And uh, even though we are sinners, we are weak, we are inadequate in, in so many ways, we find it hard to love our families and minister in our families. And we know that often in our families, that's where we let out the worst in ourselves as well. Thank, thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ. And thank you for the opportunity um, to be involved in, in frontline discipleship at home. And to pray for those of us who are married, that we will um, love our spouse. Um, we will um, be intentional in pursuing them and, and, and loving them. 
And we pray, Lord, that for those of us who are parents, whether of young children or um, grown-up children, um, that you would help us to be good models of what it looks like to follow Jesus, to be prayerful, to be good teachers. And um, for those of us who are grandparents, um, we pray, Lord, that you help us to know how to be present in the lives of our grandchildren, our children, um, to, uh, yeah, to, to again, to model what it looks like to follow follow Christ. And Lord, in your mercy, we do pray that, that all of our children and grandchildren, that they would grow up to, to know Jesus and, and love Jesus, and not just know and love him, but want to give their lives to, to serving him and to making him known um, to others. We know that um, only you can bring that um, to fruition. So we pray, Lord, that you would um, yeah, mercifully bring that um, bring that to you. So we thank you for our time together today and uh, we commit ourselves to you as we go through the rest of this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray.